Thank you and welcome everyone on this cold, beautiful January sunny day to this week's meeting of Bloomington Rotary Club. I am your current president, Sally Gaskell. Thank you so much for being here. Our vision is to be a diverse and engaged community of leaders whose fellowship and service have a significant impact in our community and throughout the world. Hank Heichema, would you please offer the reflection today? Thank you, uh, President Sally. Um, last November um, and December, my wife and I were in the Netherlands to visit family and friends. And we also had a chance to go through photos and documents my mother had left behind. She passed away in May, 2020. Here, I found a small crumbled notebook of my father, a longtime Rotarian who passed away in 1988. I think you, here you see it. Uh, when leafing through it, I found out after a couple of pages of scratched out notes, a story that started on May 10 of 1940. This was the day the German army attacked the Netherlands without any warning. The diary contained eight days of war experience of my dad as a sergeant in the Dutch army stationed in Dordrecht, the city near Rotterdam, to defend bridges over the River Rhine. I won't read you the entire diary, but thought it might be of interest to share a few excerpts. I quote, in the morning at around 4.30 a.m., German airplanes over Dordrecht. We see paratroops coming down, getting dressed and to the school get coffee and 20 cartridges. We have to control an intersection with a patrol of about 10 men. We don't know who to shoot at since we received notice that the Germans are dressed like Dutch soldiers. We are lying behind a dike and watch the large bridge, but then they shoot at us from behind with a machine gun. The bullet hits the dike next to us. The men are retreating in a hole in the ground. Then. Behind us, Marines and pontoons arrive in blue uniforms. At first, we think that they are Germans and we fire at them. Fortunately, no hits. These were Dutch soldiers. Mm -hmm. This is a tale of much confusion among the Dutch soldiers. He continues to describe how some of his comrades are hit by the Germans, oftentimes mortally wounded. They are ordered to retreat to a previous position in the town of Dordrecht. And then, I quote, a civilian calls from the other side of the street, saying that a wounded man is lying behind his house. A Marine and I rush across the street, armed. I walk through the house and put my carbine down in the kitchen and walk outside. There is a wounded man lying on the ground, one of ours. I turn him over, but his face is all bloody. I call out to a civilian to help drag him inside. At that moment, a bullet whistles past me and I'm looking into two battles of German submachine guns. This is it, I thought. Fortunately, the Germans saw that my father was unarmed and took him prisoner of war. In the remainder of the diary, he describes his experiences as a prisoner. He explains how the Dutch soldiers were completely surprised. Some lying in their pajamas shooting at German airplanes with World War I carbines carbines while the German paratroopers were all armed with modern submachine guns. It is fascinating to read the mix of real news and rumors he received in captivity. No, the city of The Hague was not bombed and destroyed. And no, Italy and America did not now, early May 1940, join the war against Germany. In fact, in June of that year, Italy joined Germany. The Germans released the Dutch prisoners of war in early June that same year. I have read much about the Second World War, but nothing is so captivating as a story written by your own dad while he lived it and almost not survived it. Thank you, uh, Sally. I'll Michael, with the back to you. Wow. Wow, Hank. Did your mother ever talk about this recollection of her father's? Yes, I knew the scene of, of his captivity, but uh, what I read, but everything after that, while he was in captivity, uh, and, and, and those were unique experiences, I had no idea. I never heard about it. Mm. Well, 
we're grateful that she uh, kept the diary and that you have it now. And everyone should look at sure their own not. family's pieces of information if you've got them lying around like I do in many, many boxes in my attic. And one, one of these days I'll get to them. Thank you so much. Hank Walter, we have a number of guests today. Can you start by introducing them? Be happy to, Sally. Um, so uh, speaking of Hank Heidema, his uh, wife, Binica, is with us. Um, and our speaker, Jeff White, and his wife, Lejean White, are also here um, as guests of Hank's. Uh, Jim Bright has th at least three guests with us, three that I know of. Uh, Susan, Al Susan Adams from the New Albany Rotary Club. Keith Weedman from the Columbus, Indiana Rotary Club, and Michelle Gilchrist, who's executive director of the Bloomington Health Foundation and a former member of the Memphis, Tennessee Club. And then Connie Shakalis has a guest, Stephanie Von Hirschberg. Oh, good. Thank you. And I believe I also saw Randy West check in. He would be a guest of Jim Bright. Welcome. Anybody else we're missing? If not, thank you, Hank. Welcome to all of you, ro visiting Rotarians and uh, plain old guests. We meet here every week, currently on Zoom, and you are welcome to come back at any time, Tuesday at noon, and join us. So I want to thank our producers today, Michael Shermas, Joy Harder, and Natalie Blaze. Michael, I just want to announce that we made it through last week without you for the first time in two years, holy heck. Um, it was a, a major accomplishment that we did that. Today's roundabout reporter is Alan, Alan Barker. And let's see, we've got some birthdays. Leslie Green, I always love the fact that I share my birthday week with Leslie Green. Her birthday is on January 27th, Aquarian. And a member anniversary, Bill Brown, you've been with us for one year. You joined us on Zoom. We got to meet you in person. You had to ask, what is the protocol for meeting in person? I loved that. And now mm -hmm. here we are back <laughs> on Zoom. Speaking of, an, of, of meeting on Zoom, um, I wanna tell everyone that uh, the board of directors met last week on Zoom. And uh, we made the decision to continue Zoom only meetings through the month of February so that our speakers have uh, ample time to prepare for Zoom presentations and that we can um, let all of you know that we'll be on Zoom through February. And then of course we will reconsider your safety is our absolute uh, priority. And so we're looking at the uh, weekly COVID breakout um, data for Monroe County and we'll keep on doing that. Hope to see you back in person in March. But in the meantime, it's really great to have everybody here on Zoom. And you know, we get to see people like Bill Perkins and um, let's see, Dick, I believe are both in Arizona this week. Um, probably some others of you as well. Uh, my other announcement is um, big thanks, huge thanks go to Amy Osajima, a member of our board who has agreed to take over as our scholar scholarships committee chair. I'm really grateful to Amy for picking this up in the midst of, of uh, the rotary year. Um, fortunately, uh, Matt Stitzinger had to step down for um, family reasons, but um, the, the bulk of the committee, uh, which of course was headed up by Byron Bangard for, I think it was 25 years, Byron, something like that. <laughs> um, and Amy has inherited all of Byron's good note keeping and um, we're looking forward to reaching out to the um, graduating seniors uh, from our area high schools this year, as well as to Ivy Tech students to award our really important scholarships. And the first meeting in May will be our scholarships presentation. So if anyone who's here would like to join the scholarships committee for this year, if you've never done it before, um, just let Amy Osajima or me know, and we'll be happy to put you on the committee. And now we've got time for happy dollars to benefit Teachers Warehouse. If you are happy for any reason, uh, please give a dollar or two up to Teachers Warehouse, which was founded by Bloomington Rotary Club many years ago and has continued to serve the community and it, the educational world. Um, is now, now is a 501c3. 
Charlotte Zitlow, are you happy about something? I think you're, I think you're muted. You may be happy, but you're muted. Muted. No, no. Can you hear me? That's good. Okay. I am happy because my staying up until 3.30 last night paid off and, uh, and Rafael Nadal won his, his, his first of in the, in the round of 16. He'll, he's on his way to his 21st Grand Slam. Excellent news so, from so, the land of Australia. And from this great sports fan here. <laughs> Any other sports happiness or, or otherwise happiness? I'll take the mic. Please uh, do. Okay. I would like to pledge $25 in honor of uh, our guests, uh, Jeff and Legine White. Wonderful. I would like to have a happy dollar, please. Absolutely, Sandy. Okay, these are 20 happy dollars in behalf of one of my clients that has gone from one place to another that has just been an extraordinary life story. She happens to be a past international Rotary scholar. And when I met her back in 2002, her life had gone um, completely downhill. And I had the pleasure last week of writing a recommendation letter for her to be able to get her master's and I am just so incredibly excited for her. And I can't wait to bring her as a guest and share her all with you very soon. Awesome, Sandy, thank you. Other happy dollars. Okay, well, I have two and they're both sports related um, and they both have to do with where I come from. So one is I'm not a football fan. I really never warmed to, foot to football, but I'm from Kansas City and the Kansas City Chiefs did really well the other night. So, whoa. Uh, but, but my other piece of sports news is family related. And that is that my um, cousin, Stacy Gaskell from Golden, Colorado is one of four American women on the US Olympic team for snowboard cross. And I'm really excited about Stacy. She's 21 years old and has an amazing future. So if you wanna tune into the Olympics in China in a couple of weeks. Stacy Gaskell, snowboard cross. I, I have a happy dollar. Yes. Um, we're on the sports theme, so I'm gonna stay there. Um, my dear childhood friend, um, Jerry Cohen, who hopefully will speak here at Rotary sometime because he lives in Seattle, um, has just sold his legendary business, Ebbets Field Flannels, to a company here in Indiana. So he is in Indiana yesterday and today, um, and I'm just celebrating his great success. So I'll pledge 10. Terrific. Oh, and I forgot to say, I'll, I'll give $10 to happy, the Happy Dollars Teachers Warehouse as well. Natalie, if you could. Me, me too. Bill me. Yes, Charlotte and I forgot. $10. And I'm happy for all the reasons everybody else is happy as well. Sarah. I have a, a late breaking happy dollar. Um, Joy Harder just texted or chatted with me over here on the side saying, asking me, did I know that, that she will be replacing me as assistant governor in the coming Rotary year? I had not heard that, but of course our own Lance Eberly will be the governor, district governor. And, and so, you know, look for a big major infusion of fun with Joy Harder as our assistant governor. Congratulations, Joy. I will add another 10 happy dollars onto that as well. <laughs> there will never be enough fun or enough joy in Rotary. Thanks for stepping up to that start. job. Good start. Anybody else? I'd like to um, give 22 happy dollars for uh, my first year in Rotary. And the goal was to get out of my office here. That didn't quite work out all the time. <laughs> Now I'm back in it and uh, also uh, anxiously awaiting to hear what Jeff White has to say. And hello to LaJean and Jeff. Haven't seen you guys for a while. Yeah. Any other happy dollars? Ah, Marcus Debro, 10 for women beating Purdue and 10 for men beating Purdue. Yay. Here, here. That would be basketball in case you live on another planet. <laughs> 
Ruth Boshkoff, were you raising your arm? Yes, you have to unmute yourself. Now, can you hear me? Now we can. All right. I would like to give 15 happy dollars um, to the women's basketball team. They are amazing and uh, they deserve your support. And I love going to their games, except right now I can't go <laughs> to places like that. <laughs> but yes, do go and watch the women. Uh, I thought... Basically, I think they're doing a lot better than the men right now. So here, 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 here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for all the support of Teachers Warehouse. And uh, without further ado, I, too, am really looking forward to what Jeff White has to, has to say. I remember very much the last time you spoke to us at Bloomington Rotary. And um, with that, Hank, I'm going to turn it back to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Sally. Well, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Jeff White, who is Professor Emeritus of Environmental Science and Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Indiana University. He has been at IU for 38 years and was founding director of IU's Integrated Program in the Environment. Prior administrative positions at IU include Associate Vice Provost for Research, Associate Dean of the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and Chair of Environmental Sciences. He has been recognized with honors for his research, teaching, and administrative service, including IU's Bicentennial Medal in the Yenna University Distinguished Faculty Research Lecturer and various other awards and teaching for teaching and research. He is a fellow of the U.S. Committee on Institutional Cooperation's Academic Leadership Program. He holds a PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Syracuse University, an MS in Environmental Science from Rutgers University, and a BA in Biology from Gettysburg College. His research focuses on evaluating the impact of human activity on aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Since 1990, he has been studying how rapidly changing climate affect emissions of greenhouse gases from subarctic and arctic landscapes. This work, funded by NSF, DOE, and NASA, includes a five-year field campaign at the edge of Greenland's ice sheet. He has also investigated the directions of climate change, soil micro, uh, microbiomes, and plant communities in Alaska and northern Minnesota. Finally, and importantly, he volunteers for Citizens Climate Lobby a national nonpartisan grassroots organization focused on building support in Congress for a national policy solution to climate change. Let's not forget to ask Jeff about where that stands. Without further ado, I hand the mic to Jeff. Thank you, Hank. Very much appreciate being back to speak to Rotary. Um, in 2015, I think it was, um, Sally in invited me to speak and, and it was just a pleasure. So thanks for allowing me to come back and, and update you on what's happening with, with climate change. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and then I will um, also move my, mic, my uh, camera so that I can look directly at you in your direction. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully everyone can see that first image clearly. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. So, yeah, we'll be. Um, it, this is a whirlwind tour today. I'd like to talk about um, the science. You know what's happening with the the key metrics in in climate change. So the first part of the talk today will be just the late, literally the up to the minute uh, data on key climate change metrics. Then we'll do a quick whirlwind tour of my research activities in Greenland, which have, are really just wrapping up. We're publishing the last paper from that work um, as I speak. And then uh, the, fi the final uh, stage of our journey today will be to talk about taking action. Um, this is a critical part of my message today is that um, we really need to be moving forward on, on action on this issue. And then open it up for discussion. I'm, I'm happy to talk about any number of these um, aspects of the, the challenge we face here. All right, so uh, let's start with the Earth thermometer. So this particular image from NASA, um, I pulled down from their website in the last week, 
On the vertical axis is what's called temperature anomaly. It's just how temperature has varied relative to some common baseline. And, and they're using 1951 to 1980 as sort of a benchmark baseline for this. And what you can see in this graph, over time, since the turn of the, the 1880s, the uh, Industrial Revolution, temperature on Earth um, has been increasing, and particularly in the last uh, 20 to 40 years. The current warming rate is about 1.1 degrees. Um, so since the industrial era, the temperature on Earth has increased about 1.1 degrees centigrade. But there are other indicators that point in the same direction of, of global change in our in temperature. Um, so this is data from the uh, also from NASA and the European Space Agency. The um, the data being shown here are cumulative ice mass uh, loss on the two largest ice sheets on Earth, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. And these are measured using GRACE satellites. Um, these satellites are able to measure very, very small changes in gravitational pull. And so that is um, then used to determine how much water has been lost from these two ice sheets over time. And what you can see very clearly is that the Greenland ice sheet has sort of led the way in rapid uh, thaw and melting and loss of ice from the ice sheet that's now in the ocean and the Antarctic is following right behind it. So these two large ice sheets on Earth are both showing evidence of heat transfer as the Earth has captured more heat from greenhouse gases and it, that heat is getting transferred to various materials on Earth including ice and ice melt consumes a lot of that heat. The last indicator I want to show you um, is heat content of the oceans. Also data from, from um, the US, in this case NOAA, um, and very much up-to-date information on heat content in the ocean. And the, the ocean is actually a critical sink for heat that's being captured in Earth's atmosphere. About 90% of all of the energy that's being captured on our planet as a consequence of these greenhouse gases and their increases over time. Um, is being transferred to the ocean. So what you can see here again is an anomaly type calculation showing the heat content of the upper ocean um, and they're using a baseline in the 1980s to 1990s and it uh, has very much increased as those temperatures are warming on Earth. So some of that heat being captured is transferred to the oceans. So all three indicators are pointing in exactly the same direction and that is that heat, the heat is accumulating in the Earth system and is being transferred to our air, our um, ice sheets, and um, oceans and soils, in fact. What's the key drivers for this? Um, there are two greenhouse gases that are part the particular uh, drivers for these increases in energy um, retention on Earth. Um, CO2 on this upper left-hand panel. And these are data from uh, NOAA showing um, monthly averages of CO2 levels in Earth's atmosphere and that has continued to grow since the Industrial Revolution. Also methane, another key greenhouse gas, has been increasing during the industrial era as well and these are both being driven by the consumption, utilization, mining, extraction of fossil fuels. Um, so um, those are key indicators. Now I'd like to um, ask the question what does that mean for some of the research that I do um, and the key factor here for me as a scientist studying uh, changes in Earth's landscapes is what's happening in the Arctic. So the Arctic is experiencing much faster warming, three to four times the rate of the rest of the Earth. There are several factors that contribute to this. The ice loss changes that lead to albedo changes, the reflectivity of the Earth, and also atmospheric mixing that's transferring heat in from um, southern latitudes. This is also now happening in the Antarctic um, where there's significant um, increase in the speed of warming in the Antarctic. So what does that mean for me as a scientist studying processes going on on the Earth's surface? What I've been focused on is what's called the Arctic amplification phenomenon which is um, as the um, Arctic warms it is causing feedbacks with Earth's atmosphere in the greenhouse gas realm. So let's look at this feedback loop that I have uh, sketched out here. In the upper left is this rapid extraction and use of fossil, fossilized carbon through the use of methane, coal, and natural gas. As we've used those to drive the engine of industrialization, 
that has increased the CO2 and methane in the atmosphere, which leads to the warming of the Earth's atmosphere. And as I mentioned before, the transfer of heat to the Earth's surface and various materials. Um, one of the materials that's increasing in temperature is land surface soils. So there's an increase in the land surface temperatures, which then stimulates in a decomposition of organic material in soils and sediments. And that then leads to the production of additional greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, which then are able to be admitted back to the atmosphere. So that sort of brings us back around this positive reinforcing feedback loop. What matters um, a lot to the warming in the atmosphere from this phenomenon is how much of that uh, carbon goes off as methane versus CO2. And that is because methane is a much more efficient greenhouse gas. It's about 25 to 30 times more efficient than CO2. So the balance of how much carbon goes off as methane versus CO2 is really important to the work that I do and really is the basis for the research that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, so why the Arctic? Why are we focused on researching the changes going on in the Arctic? It's warming very quickly, but there's also a tremendous potential for the production of greenhouse gases. So, um, for example, small lakes um, the, shown in this picture represent about 50% of surface waters in the Arctic, and their area is supposed to, uh, is projected to increase with warming, and their potential for methane production is also projected to increase significantly as a consequence of this Arctic amplification. But these processes that we're talking about here are really sort of poorly understood. We haven't looked at them in great detail in recent um, decades. And the climate modelers who are building models to forecast future climate really need to understand these processes and include them in their models. And they're currently not in there. So that is the motivation for the research that I've been doing that's been funded by NASA that Hank mentioned in the introduction. Microbial methane production, storage, and emission of these kinds of greenhouse gases from Arctic lakes and wetlands has been a focus of my work since 1990. Um, so let's take a look on a sort of a quick tour of that research that I've been involved in for the last uh, 10 years or so. The Arctic is defined by an area on the, on the globe above 66.5 degrees north, and that's represented by this, the, the sun cycle in this part of the world uh, where they have at least one day of complete darkness or complete um, light, uh, as, as depending on which season. Uh, Greenland sits mostly in the Arctic realm. Here it is in the, in the lower left. And our study area, if you move to the right-hand side of this image, our study area for this project was in Kangarlusawak on the southwestern edge of the Greenland ice sheet. So let's talk about um, how we get there. Um, the project is funded by NASA, and we use the Nat U.S. National Guard, Air National Guard, to get us to and from and all of our equipment. And they are training pilots um, regularly to fly these transport planes. And in, in the process of training pilots, they're willing to take materials and equipment and people to and from these, um, these distant places. They serve the Arctic in the summer, northern hemisphere summer, and they serve the Antarctic in the southern hemisphere summer. Um, so there's uh, the C-130 and the C-17 are the two big planes that are used to take us back and forth. Here's an inside shot from the cabin. Uh, we sit in cargo netting. There are, there are no seats and no beverage service, um, but they are also not charging us for baggage. So we take about 2,000 pounds of equipment and they don't charge us for the baggage. Um, they get, we pay $1,000 a quote unquote seat. <clears throat> we land on an airfield that was built during World War II. Um, this is the Kangarlusawak airfield. It was built by the Danish and the US Air Force and now is used for commercial as well as military traffic. And um, they also have in that, um, in that area uh, some facilities that are being used for research now that were used for military purposes. There's a gravel road that runs up to the ice sheet and we're able to get partway up into our field area by driving in a four wheel drive. Um, this particular building that we stage out of is called the Kangarlusawak International Science Support Facility. It's an old U.S. Air Force barracks building, and um, it serves as a tremendous facility for, for doing science in the remote regions. Um, we have it far better than the folks who are working at McMurdo Station in the Antarctic. Um, warm, cozy kitchens, bathrooms, um, facilities for doing lab work. It's, it's really fantastic. It's called KISS Base Camp. <clears throat> 
Um, I also want to give a shout out to my uh, my number one uh, collaborator on this project who had, came into my office one day and invited me to join her on a NASA research proposal, and that is Lisa Pratt. Um, many, many of you may know Lisa, a longtime member of IU faculty. She was also hired by NASA at the end of her career to, to serve as the planetary protection officer for, and just retired from that job last year. Um, so the other key players in this kind of work are all of the graduate students and postdocs that worked on this project. And this is a collection of some of them. Um, and uh, they are really the heavy lifters on this kind of research. Um, in summer and winter, uh, we were sampling these small lakes and wetlands up in this area of Greenland. We did detailed physical, chemical, biological profiling of seven lakes in our study area and as I say, both winter and summer. So let me talk you through a little bit of the of how that work is done. Um, first of all, the field area is spectacularly beautiful during both the winter and the summer. It was a real pleasure and an honor for me to be able to do this work. Um, and in the summers, uh, we were up there and the temperature was 65 degrees during the day and it was just spectacularly beautiful. In the winters, many sunny days, very cold temperatures. And this is how I spent my spring breaks. Um, but honestly, I would, I would go back in a heartbeat. <clears throat> it's just so nice, just so beautiful. Um, here's summertime sampling. Uh, we use small and uh, backpackable inflatable rafts to get out on these lakes and collect all the data that we needed to, to do our studies on methane cycling. Um, in the wintertime, the lakes were covered with six and a half feet of ice, so we didn't need boats, um, but we did need ice uh, screws to cut down through um, six and a half feet of ice to be able to get down into the water columns to study methane cycling there. Uh, we also did a lot of other very detailed uh, measurements of the processes that control the cycling of greenhouse gases. Um, in addition to the water work, we also collected sediments from the bottom of lakes to figure out what the storage capacity was for methane in the sediments as well as the soils um, on these landscapes. So um, at this point, I'm going to talk about some data. And I, I, this is not a data-rich presentation. It's really to give you a flavor for the kind of work um, and how it's done that are such important pieces to unraveling this climate change story, um, at least my part of it. And so let's talk a bit about some of the data that were generated from these detailed studies that we were doing on lakes in Greenland. On, the, on this slide, I'm showing on the vertical axis um, the total inventory of methane stored in the lakes in our study group. And I've split this data out as summer uh, inventories in the green um, and then in the winter in blue. And these little plots are called whisker plots. They show the median value as a cross hatch across the bar. And then they show these whiskers that are the range in the values of methane storage in the, in the uh, group of study lakes. I've split the data out to co compare the warmest summer on record during the time we were up there, 2012, versus um, a more typical year, 2013, to show you the differences between warm year records of methane in these lakes versus cold, colder or moderate uh, temperature records. Um, over here in the wintertime, you'll see in 2013, we had very large methane storage in these lakes under ice. And this was a consequence of the warm summer. So warm summer conditions produced a lot of methane storage in these lakes, which then carried over to the winter that followed. In this 2013 summer data set, we had much lower values and much lower inventories of methane in the lakes in the study group. And the following winter also then had lower inventories. So one of, some of the key findings from this type of research, what we found is that winter inventories um, very much are influenced by the summer that precedes them. And so uh, microbes producing methane, that methane is stored in the lakes. Some of it's released to the atmosphere during the summer, but some of it gets carried over into the winter. And then it's stored under ice until the ice goes off the lake in the spring. So warm weather conditions are yielding higher, high, higher and higher methane inventories in these lakes, and that summer production carries over into winter. 
So some of the key uh, take-home messages from this and a lot of other work that we have done up in these, in these landscapes is as follows. Um, warmer summers lead to increased methane inventories as a consequence of increased methane production. This is all microbial activity going on in these lakes and the wetlands around them. Um, and the largest inventories are probably going to be under ice cover at the end of winter. So one of the things that we've been trying to do um, is get into these lakes during late winter to see how much methane is being released when the ice goes off the lakes. Very difficult to do logistically to get in there at that time of year. And so far, um, NASA has not been willing to fund a follow-on study of that type. Ben, um, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back. So, um, somebody needs to mute there. Um, then, then uh, another take-home message from the work that we've been doing is that methane and CO2 emissions are likely to increase as a consequence of this Arctic amplification. Um, and the current climate models that are being used to predict and project future climate conditions and also to set targets um, for how much carbon emissions reductions are necessary are probably under predicting um, what is happening with, uh, with uh, the landscape feedback that I'm talking about as we go forward. And I think that's a critical issue and, and the climate modeling community is definitely all over this right now. They're working very hard to try to incorporate some of these processes into their models. Um, so this is team science at its best. Um, it's been the highlight of my career. Um, I would, as I said before, we are, we are trying to get back there to continue with this kind of work. Um, and the fund, funding climate has been pretty challenging in recent years. Um, so I, I want to turn our attention now to what do we do? Um, this whole issue requires aggressive action and it requires immediate action. This is not a can that can continue to be kicked down the road. Um, a quote that I often talk about, this is my, my own quote, this is me, um, is, you know, there's several elements to this. One, nature really doesn't care about what we believe or don't believe about climate change. It is going to do what it's going to do. It's going to follow the laws of physics, for example, um, and they are playing out right before our eyes. Um, we're engaged in a, in a dangerous planetary experiment um, as we continue to burn fossil fuels at higher and higher rates. So we need to face the realities, honestly, and need and do that now rather than continue to hide inside fictions frankly so there are three harsh realities related to this one is um this is a time limit we have global temperatures rising that predictions are right now to two three degrees by 2100 um we're also we're already up to one and 1.1 1 .1. um and the faster we reduce those emissions the lower the burden not so much on us I think the burdens really will come to bear on future generations. Um, and that's one of the great challenges in this particular issue is that the, the majority of the burdens will, will, will lie with future generations. Um, doing nothing, which many of us, you know, sometimes our attitude is, look, let's not do anything because we really don't understand this fully. The problem with doing nothing is it magnifies the problem. The threats to human societies and ecosystems are magnified by the doing nothing approach. Also, there's no reverse gear. Um, we cannot turn back the CO2 accumulations that are, have occurred over the course of the industrial era. Um, and uh, the declines that will come with reductions in CO2 emissions um, are going, the, the recovery of the climate system is going to lag behind by hundreds of years, which is why the burdens are playing out for future generations in a much larger way. And also geoengineering to reverse course um, is fraught with uncertainty. And we can talk more about in that in the, in the Q&A. All right, so um, here is sort of how the scenarios play out as we think about what to do with future action. On this particular graph, I'm showing global emissions in gigatons of CO2 per year versus time. Here's our historical emission pattern here growing, continuing to increase with utilization of fossil fuels. And then there are various scenarios that are given here in different colors. This magenta one, no climate policies, would be if we had done nothing and continued to do nothing. 
um, that would generate temperatures by 2100 of close to 5 degrees centigrade. If we follow what is currently on the table, um, current policies that are in place worldwide, the projections by 2100 are around 2.7 to 3 degrees C increase. Remember, we're currently at 1.1 degrees C increase. If we go with some of the aggressive pledges and targets that have been in place as a consequence of the climate accords and the climate summits, uh, we're looking at probably about 2.4 degrees centigrade by 2100. That's with what we consider to be sort of our best offers that are currently on the table. If by chance we have the political will to really ratchet down on CO2 emissions by 2100, we could get, we could see potentially a world of no more than two degrees centigrade warming. So that's, that is what the current models are projecting in terms of action and climate warming going forward. All right. So what do we do? What do we do as individuals? What do we do as communities? Um, number one, I think we need federal climate legislation. Economists worldwide are saying that carbon pricing is probably our best tool. Not the only tool, but probably the best tool. And carbon pricing would incentivize decarbonizing our energy systems through technology innovation, energy efficiency gains, expansion of renewable energy, and so on. Um, and this needs to be done, implemented quickly and boldly, and requires national leadership. Um, there's bipartisan support that exists in Washington right now for this. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that that gets done. So one thing you can do, one thing I can do, is call and write legislators. Call, write the, the White House and tell them that we need action on climate change. We need federal legislation action on climate change. That we can all do. Um, the other thing we can do is take action at the local level with friends, families, acquaintances. Talk about the issue. You know, it is a conversation that has to take place and it needs to be done, I believe, in a respectful dialogue with, with anyone and everyone who will listen. Um, and it needs to be repeated over and over again. This, this has to be part of the political and personal discourse that we all have. And then if we all can get involved and get involved in organizations we believe in, like Rotary and others, um, and, and help to work through our communities in that manner as well. And for me, this has been, uh, when I retired in 2020, I decided I needed to do more than just my science. And so I've been volunteering for an organization that Hank mentioned in the introduction, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a nonpartisan group. It's grassroots, but it's working very closely with members of Congress to build the political will to take action through legislative um, means on climate change. They are advocating, um, CCL is advocating for the carbon pricing approach, but there, we're also open to any number of other scenarios that would, um, would rapidly transition, transition us away from fossil fuels to renewables. All right, so I'm going to um, pause there to open things up for Q&A. So I'm gonna stop my screen share if by chance we want to go back to any of the images that I've been showing, we can do that. Um, but let me go ahead and um, step back from my mic, my mic and, and take questions. <clears throat> Jeff, thank you very much. Um, who has the first question? That, this is hard to believe, folks. You know, I mean, this is the rotary. These, you know, folks. Uh, I, I, I expect. I, I expect. No fear. I Michael expect. Shermas. Michael Shermas. Yeah, um, uh, Jeff. Not to say that uh, the uh, people in the ivory tower don't mix with the masses, but um, my expectation is that, uh, our assumption is that, is that you don't get out as much with people who are. Uh, outright denying uh, climate change and the issues around it. Um, and when you do, when that does happen, I'm, I'm assuming it has to happen some of the time, um, what are the uh, kind of arguments you have to use? Because I'm sure, well, it wouldn't surprise me if many of us here uh, have run into that issue where we you know, uh, run into people who climb down and we don't know how to respond to them as well as we might. What do you say when you run into those kind of people? Yeah, and um, thank you for the question. It, it, there's no question that I'm, I encounter climate deniers all the time. Um, 
some of them are not brave enough to, you know, open up that, that conversation. Um, I think they quietly go away and just continue to think the thoughts that they have. And, and obviously I don't have an opportunity then um, to engage them in a conversation. Occasionally I will get the, the, the open dialogue with folks like that. And what I say to them is I, I understand that you, you may see the world in a certain way, but um, trust me that the science just simply does not support it. And if we're going to trust science to advise us on a range of issues in our lives, um, this one has to be in there. This, this is an issue that really requires the very best science, the very best economics, the very best political science and sociology and psychology. It is the huge challenge of our lifetime and our children and our grandchildren. Um, and so this is not the time to turn away from something that has been so fundamental to our advancement as society, right? I mean, to, for now to deny science, um, I, you know, is, it, this, is a, this is the wrong time to be, to be turning away from, from science, so. Okay, thank you. A... We've got four questions and I'm gonna go in this order. Lance, followed by Jeff, followed by Alan, followed by Liz. Lance. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Uh, Lance Everly, thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, I work in an industry that is uh, certainly following this very, very closely, and that's the insurance industry. And uh, certainly we're following the data. You know, we see the increased weather activity, the increased claims activities as it results into it. My question would be is how can we kind of help facilitate these industries that are seeing the negative impacts, you know, to help make a positive change? And how can we increase our voice collectively, you know, to help the legislators, you know, make those changes? Yeah, um, the, your voice is critical. Um, I think members of Congress are waiting to hear from people of all walks of life about this issue. Um, it, it is not at the top of the agenda for many but they are paying very close attention to the individual voices and to corporations and to interest groups, of course. Um, and they're not hearing enough from all aspects of human society, right? Not just the individual voter. Um, so, you know, part of what I've been doing with CCL is trying to broker connections with industries of all types, um, to try to communicate with legislators the, the importance of this issue. Um, so that would be one thing I would say is take the opportunity to ha have your voice heard by your local representatives, by, um, by statewide representatives, um, and of course the White House. You know, they're, they're getting lots of calls and letters um, on a whole range of issues. And what we're hearing from our the folks that work closely with legislators and with the, with the, with the White House is that they, they are listening. They are, they are counting those calls. It matters. So um, I would say that for sure. Jeff Richardson. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, great presentation. I, um, I, I, I want to be optimistic about your uh, claim of, um, or your belief that there's bipartisan support. I, certainly with the vaccine <laughs> issue, we've seen science being under siege more than in, in my lifetime. And, I, um, and I've been around a while. So I, I'm just wondering when you say bipartisan, uh, I wanna be cautiously optimistic about that, but are you believing that to be widespread bipartisanship or do you feel it's more, uh, we've got some key people uh, uh, in one party versus the other and that there's, you're hopeful, but I, I just, what's the extent of this bipartisan belief um, that I want to embrace incidentally, but I'm a little um, skeptical at this point. What, what kind of challenge do we have ahead, both on the state and national level uh, to truly create a bipartisan coalition to make the things happen that you're suggesting? Thank you. Yes, thanks, Jeff. I, um, I know for a fact that there are competing proposals that are carbon price proposals um, that are, that are uh, both Republican proposals and Democrat proposals. So the idea of carbon pricing, putting a price on carbon, 
returning some of that uh, that dividend back to um, households or whatever. Those are ideas that are uh, there are almost identical proposals on the Republican side and the Democratic side. The question is what happens to those under the current administration and the battles over those issues of do we give them a win? It's not that they don't believe that this they being the Republicans or they being the Democrats, they don't believe that carbon pricing could work and that it's important and we need to reduce carbon emissions and this is a, is a path forward. They are fully supportive of these ideas. The harder battles have to do with the politics of do we let them win or not? You know, mm -hmm. the Build Back Better bill is that, do, you know, are we, are we just going to be against it because that's where we are as a party right now? Um, those kinds of issues, I, I don't have an answer for, for you on that, but I can answer your question about whether there is bipartisan support in this kind of idea. There is. Um, the question is, what, where does that play out in terms of final legislation that's signed? sealed and delivered. That's a bigger question. I don't know whether the current bill is going to do it um, if it gets through. And you know the, the story with, with what's happening with Manchin and the hold up there. Um, and uh, it may very well work its way in at some future time and in some other form. But there clearly we're seeing uh, support of this idea on both sides of the aisle. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Alain. Jeff, it's really great to have you with us again. Absolutely amazing um, and also terrifying. So um, the, the one question that I have is more um, sort of sociological is, you know, there, there's this a phenomenon where on the one hand, there's this sort of denial factor and then all of a sudden it's fatalistic, you know, this sense of, oh, well, first of all, it's not there. And then when it becomes apparent that it's there, it's just too much to handle. And then people just flip out and, and focus on other things um, short term. What can you say to um, how, we can transition as a society into a place of emergency. Mm. Wow. Um, that is the question, Alan. I mean, it's uh, it, how do we how do we psychologically deal with a challenge of this scale um, as individuals, as communities, um, and it represents the, I think the largest challenge we've faced. I mean, COVID is obviously huge and it's a, it's an enormous challenge, but this one is much more insidious um, because it's so long-term um, it, there are no vaccines, right? Um, and the scale of the problem is such that when, when we take action, the action needs to be bold, and it needs to be sustained over generations. Okay, this is not a this is not a one two year, one two decade kind of commitment. This is a century kind of scale dedication to a shift away from something that has brought us to where we are. Let's face it, right? We are as comfortable as we are right now because of the amazing capacity of fossil fuels to drive the industrialization and the large scale food systems we have and so on and so forth, right? We are enjoying the fruits of that remarkable technology. But there was this delayed cost that we need to face. Um, and so what I often talk about when I'm in, in front of groups like this is, let's realize that we have the capacity to change, right? We just need to be dedicated to that and patient, right? We need to be willing to say, this is a transition that we need to engage in now. We know what it looks like because we've already started it. Um, but we need to be patient and realize that the dividends will not be um, experienced by me personally. It will be my children, my grandchildren, and their children that are really going to reap the benefits of what we do now. That, and that is a hard thing for humans, I think, to psychologically um, appreciate um, and take action on. Thank you, Jeff. You knew we would have lots of questions and we have several more. We've got Liz Feidel and Charlotte Zitlow at least. Would you be able to stay after we close the meeting at one o'clock and, and hang on for a few more questions? Me? Yes. Oh, I'd be, I'd be happy to stay all afternoon. <laughs> we won't ask that of you, but we will. Um, 
uh, go ahead and thank you so much for your talk right now. Um, <laughs> could not be more timely. And thank you for um, reinforcing the message that's the most important one for all of us. Um, Jeff, in honor of your talk today, we will be making a donation to Cardinal Stage. Wow. And um, we look forward to having you back in the future and to the next round. Um, and now, Alan Barker, would you please introduce next week's program? Sure. Um, everybody, our next week's uh, program on Zoom, once again, as Sally mentioned, uh, will be uh, Gerhard Glom. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He's professor um, at IU chair of the Department of Economics. And his talk is gonna be titled, Some Economics of Life and Death. His research and teaching interests include uh, macroeconomics, uh, economic growth, some dis uh, economic, uh, sorry, income distribution and the political economy. Okay, thank you. And uh, Natalie, would you please share the four-way test graphic and we will end the meeting with the recitation of our four-way test plus one. Of the things we think, think say, say, or do. Or do. Or do. First, 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 is it the true? Second, 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 is it fair, is it fair to, all to all consider? Third, 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 will it build, will it build good goodwill? Will, 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 Fourth, will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? Concern. And fifth, is it fun? Thank you all. Go, go be well. Um, just think of my imaginary bell ringing in the background um, of your life and um, see you next week. And for those of us who can stay, Jeff White, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, stay with us. Absolutely. Um, so Liz Feidel, you are up. Thank you. Um, during this whole thing, I've heard a lot about how it's going to impact future generations, obviously. And I can't help but think that years ago when my children were in elementary school, long before recycling became as big as it was, there was a big push through the elementary school to get their families to be on board with recycling. So I'm wondering what you think is maybe there are things already being done in the K through 12 um, to get them a little more energized to maybe help get their families a little more energized to be a part of making major change for the long term. What do you think uh, is happening there and how can we help that happen? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, this, this one's a little bit less um, hands-on in some respects than recycling, right? Because, you know, what do we as individuals do in our, in our houses, in our households that really demonstrate that we understand the challenge and that we can, you know, are willing to take some, some actions on our own. So there may be some creative thinking that's needed for that, but I, I'm sure there's opportunities there to interact with our children about over this issue. Um, I'm not as closely in touch with schools um, as I'd like to be actually. Um, part of that is after I came off sabbatical, uh, you know, COVID just got in the way of doing some of these kinds of things. but. Um, we have been in the schools talking to them, uh, mostly high schools, ab about issues related to like climate policy, right? Um, the fact that there's a role for government in, in helping to facilitate this transition and so on. So there's communication, I think, going on in the schools, in, in science and civics classes around this issue because it's very much a science civics kind of phenomenon, right? It's not enough to, to, to recycle, if you will. We need to be also thinking in these bigger, larger issues like transitioning our energy. Um, so um, there, I think there are ways that we can do what you're suggesting, which is engage young people in this early in their lives so that it becomes part of their, just the way that they think. Um, but it'll, it'll take a, more creativity, I think, to do that successfully. Great question. Charlotte, you are next. You need to unmute yourself. Not sure, Sally, if she heard you. Can you Charlotte? hear me? There, there she you is. Go, Charlotte. Charlotte, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Two things. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I must say I've served on the scholarship committee for 
Rotary, both in the local schools and, and the global scholarship. And I will say that, that my reason I do that is because these young people coming up almost to a person have made this something, have speak it to this point and are, are energized by it. And that's, that gives me hope. So I think that we, we should build on that. But the question I had was, do you see any, any uh, effective legislation being produced at any level, either states, statewide or, or federal? And how can Rotary, um, how can Rotary as an organization which believes in, in all these things, how can, how can this large international organization uh, make this maybe a priority? Yeah, I, in Jeff Richardson's question, I talked a little bit about this, Charlotte, I, and I, I think there are bills um, that are out there in, in, on the Hill now that include what I believe and many economists, including, including your speaker coming up, Gerhard Blom, who's, who knows carbon tax very well, mm. uh, they would advocate that legislation that's based on this approach would be effective um, a legislation for this. And so that's there. And, and the question is where, when, and how might it get incorporated in something that is, makes it through Congress, right? So there, there are pieces of it now in the Build Back Better bill, it's there. The question is what will it look like if, if and when that ever gets passed? Um, and what would happen to it if it doesn't on this particular opportunity? So um, yet the answer to one question you asked, which is, um, is there a legislative approach, is, is yes, there is. Um, and uh, we're actually very close, closer than we've ever been um, to actually having that kind of legislation uh, voted in. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question, Charlotte. It has to do with Rotary playing a part. Oh, yeah. Well, so, so Rotary is a very important voice. Um, this is an a, a international organization that is, has very deep representation from a whole host of different parts of our society. So um, I, I think those kinds of organizations um, speaking up about the importance of climate legislation um, is, and national leadership on this issue uh, is, is, is very important, more, if we have more of those. Um, the, the business community is doing this. Um, and uh, you know, Rotary could certainly join them. Okay, great. Okay, we've got our work cut out for us. Aaron and Martha. Aaron or Martha. Hi. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Jeff, for the presentation and all the great work you're doing. Um, what I'm seeing is that we have some parties in the, U the U.S., some institutions that are risk averse. And we have a lot of them that are entirely risk friendly. Mm -hmm. um, the military has strong position on uh, climate change and is very concerned. It's going to be billions or trillions of dollars that they'll need to uh, you know, replace their infrastructure, move it on, you know, um, upland uh, from the coasts. Uh, the insurance industry also is is very well aware of this, and they're 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 open. But then we have industries that are totally based on risk. Uh, the high, the more the better, and and who have a culture of denial, um, a culture of intuition, and one of those is land management and uh, property development. Hmm. Um, we have all these people who own property that if we start to recognize the problem of climate change and you know, rising ocean levels, they're gonna lose a fortune. And so a lot of this creates dissonance with people who, who have investments and nowhere more than in the stock market. I don't see how we can make a major change you know, at, at a time when the stock market keeps going up and everybody is just you know, in this feeding frenzy. Of course, now we have some setbacks, but I'm, I'm waiting for that uh, concern about climate change to be reflected in um, challenges to the stock market. And I think that's going to happen at some point and we're gonna see some real dip. 
when that happens, I think people will be looking, will be more receptive to understanding some of the risks that we've taken and some of the, you know, some of the problems that are inevitably going to arise. And your comment. Yeah, I would, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, it, we are, uh, as a society, including our, the, the economic systems that we, we are, um, we participate in, are not wired for this kind of a challenge. This is part of the insidiousness of it, is that it sneaks up on you. Yes, we get the occasional really bad uh, storm events that hit coastal areas and, and we scramble and, and it becomes a big issue, uh, but then it goes away, right? Our, our attention span is not long enough to really you know, continue to have this as part of our decision-making, right? Because once the storm is cleaned up, we move on to something else, right? So th this whole climate change thing, it presents some of the greatest challenges that we have faced as society um, for lots of different reasons, including the ones you just mentioned. Um, so unfortunately, you know, the disasters seem to be the ones that move the needle the most. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know, there is, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but I, I try to continue to raise the, the issue, the larger issue of it's a big, it, it is a big challenge that needs immediate action and sustained action. Um, and there's no question that that is a reality of this problem. Um, it has to be systemic, sustained, worldwide action. Uh, yeah, no way around it. Hmm. So we've got Jim Bright, followed by Tim Jessen, followed by Bet Savage. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us here today. It's great to see you and Lejean. Um, I'm retired from Ford Motor Company and uh, for years, our executive chair, Bill Ford, has been an advocate for the environment. And to be honest, it fell on uh, deaf ears, I think, for many years. If uh, you read the same media that I do, you know now that Ford Motor Company is involved in a race to deliver a total EV fleet, electric vehicles. And my question to you is, how important <clears throat> to the environment is it for Ford Motor Company and other automakers to embrace electric vehicle technology. And obviously uh, the electricity that powers those vehicles has to be generated somewhere, somehow. And uh, is, is that a concern or is, is it truly clean technology in your opinion? Y yes, it is clean technology if it's produced from renewable energy sources, yeah. Um, and, and there's no question that the uh, transportation sector is huge in all of this worldwide, right? So the faster we transition to EV vehicles powered by renewable energy sources, the better off we're, we and our future generations are going to be. And it's a critical part of the overall equation. There's no question about it. Um, you, yep. Yeah, my only uh, other comment is I want you to know that uh, Rotary does place great emphasis on the environment. Uh, it is one of seven areas of focus, and it's our newest one. And I think here, you know, to me, I think a, a key would be if we could get business, government, education, and even the nonprofit uh, sector uh, working in, in alignment uh, on this effort. And uh, that's easier said than done, but, but thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Glad to. Am I next? Yes. Okay, yeah. Jeff, good to see you. And Lejean, I wish we were face to face and closer. My question is more in a philosophical mode, uh, not practical things, but what do you think is producing the anti-science uh, fever, which is sweeping our country Sunday in Washington, D.C., thousands of thousands of people, including Robert Kennedy Jr., sorry to mention him, you know, saying we don't have to pay attention to vaccinations. We don't have to pay attention to science. We're, we're, we have that stuff in our country far more than anywhere else. What's the cause of it? <laughs> I, well, let me just uh, say that I, th I think um, it is not just us. It, it is a phenomenon that is, has, has swept humanity. I, why? I, I don't know. I think it, during times of uncertainty and, uh, and worry, um, we do silly things. 
uh, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, humans, uh, you know, we, we are not the best at, um, at making practical decisions, right? Um, and crisis situations bring out the worst in our decision making. Um, so the turning away from science uh, is not just happening in the U.S. I'm sure that Hank and Bienica can talk about Europe um, and the, the, what's happening in Europe. I mean, it's happening all over the world. Um, and, uh, and so your question is why? And the answer is, boy, that is classic human uh, disconnect, right? That we, do, we are poor decision makers, particularly um, in pressure situations. And, and that is one of the really poorest decisions we've made is to deny and, and walk away and turn our backs on, on scientific information that's critical to helping us make this, the best decisions. Thank you very much. Good answer. Bet. The thing that um, bothers me the most about climate change is the poverty that results from it. With every major storm, there are people that are much, much worse off. Every major storm throughout our country, throughout the world. And uh, then with disasters, there are you know, thousands of people that are in poverty as a result. And I think um, one of the things we'll be grappling with and, and, and we're starting to grapple with is the haves getting the climate money and the have nots not getting the climate money. So building, re relocating towns or building seawalls around uh, the richer communities and that kind of a thing. And I think that's, that's a way that we can work on the ground. We can call climate refugees, climate refugees, right? We call war refugees, war refugees. We can call climate refugees, climate refugees. We can put things in, in context. What caused this person's poverty? And, and I think that might make things more real to some people. It won't seem so much uh, like a future impending disaster and more like a current crisis. Yeah, and uh, to your point uh, that the crisis is a current crisis in many impoverished parts of the world, right? Um, so it is here and now, it's not out in the future. Um, he, living here at 800 feet above sea level in, in, in the Midwestern Indiana, we're not feeling the impacts as much as many other parts of our country and the world. Um, and so, you know, we, again, humans tend to think about the local experience, the personal experience, and that sort of drives our, our daily decision making. But you make a great point. I mean, this it's a, it is a here and now problem for the um, for the, for the impoverished of the world, and that will only get bigger and get more severe as this problem continues to unfold. Right, and it's a here and now for, uh, problem for the farmers. Yeah. Oh, the farmers uh, are we, seeing uh, it. We, They're we, seeing we, it, but it's it. not being recognized. The legislators aren't listening to the farmers. Right, farming community, um, water supplies worldwide are challenged by this problem. It's displacing all kinds of different socioeconomic um, activity and groups. Thank Thanks for that, Bet. Nice yeah. Raj, I think you've had your hand up. You're muted, Raj. Thank you for being with us today. I appreciate your presentation. And it made me sad to, to hear that if, we, if I don't do something to correct the situation we are in, my innocent two grandchildren have to pay that price. Yep. Question which I was going to ask first is initiated, uh, followed by uh, another questionnaire about the EVs. Those of us who drive EV being criticized that at the current time, I am using more energy from Duke Energy to emit in the air in order to charge my car. And to them, it is a balanced deal. Nobody is winning. So would you answer the current situation we are in where Duke Energy use coal as well as gas 
to produce the energy to charge my car in my garage? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a tricky one. Um, yes, a EV user in this area is dependent unless they've got rooftop solar and they're able to charge their vehicle themselves. Um, then they depend on whatever the supply is that if you're on the Duke part of the of the network, you're you're depending on what Duke is doing um, upstream, right? Uh, how much coal, how much natural gas, and that of course varies. Um, but I I would not be pointing a finger at you as an EV user and say, well, there you go, you know, you're you're uh, you're just much of the problem as everybody else. Um, the balance in terms of overall carbon footprint for an EV vehicle, even supplied by a large scale uh, electric generating station on the Duke network, is probably certainly no worse, but but it's got to be better um, than uh, a gasoline powered uh, automobile in terms of the carbon footprint per mile traveled. So I don't know the exact numbers. I'd have to go look at what's happening. It depends, of course, on what model car you're driving, right? If, um, and so on, and the and the age of it. But that calculation is not that straightforward. People shouldn't be pointing the finger at you. And frankly, I would argue that the more interest that the American people and other drivers around the world have in EV vehicles, the faster that transition will take place, right? We'll get out of the use of fossil fuel based transportation systems into EV uh, transportation systems. And for that, you can take credit for being part of that wave. You're here. And certainly we can all um, exercise our rights as customers to have this conversation with Duke Energy as well. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I think we could, in fact, stay here all afternoon. We won't make you do that. Um, so thank you again so much. Um, clearly uh, uh, the most critical topic that we as Rotarians can be thinking about both for our own futures as well as our, our descendants. So thank you so much for being back with us. Lejean, great to see you again. Let's get together and sing sometime, you know. Yes, yes. Maybe, maybe not quite yet. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> but soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. And bye-bye to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Have a good week. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>